<laughs> recording now. This be the last time you're, you're cameraman, Patrick. Okay, we are doing circular motion today. Now we have already done rotary motion, and what on earth is the difference between rotary motion and circular motion? Rotary motion is a body that spins about an axis, probably the center, whereas circular motion is a body that's moving around a circular path from a center. The rotational properties of angle and angular velocity and angular acceleration, they're both the same. This one's gonna have those three properties as well as this one. So there's no difference there. We'll still have the same formulas like we have here. So this chart is exactly the same. We have our linear motion formulas here and the equivalent rotary motion formulas alongside. And uh, angle is still the equivalent for displacement. Angular velocity is the equivalent for velocity and angular acceleration is the equivalent for acceleration. So there's no change. What is different though is what happens when an object is traveling around on a path. This all comes back to Newton's second law F equals M A. All right, now when Newton uh, described that law, his first one, he said, if a body has no external forces applied or no net force here, we could call that net force, we could call it resultant force, if the resultant force is zero, then it has no acceleration the way it said it was. A body without an unbalanced force will continue to travel in a straight line with no acceleration. Now, when it's traveling in a circle, it's not traveling in a straight line, so it's not obeying Newton's first law, which means in order for an object to travel in a circular path, you have to have a force applied to it. You've got to pull on the object towards the center in order to make it turn. All right, now we can feel that force uh, if you were driving in a car. As you're driving uh, on the straight road, you're, you're feeling no forces. When you go in a corner, you feel a, a force pushing you uh, towards the outside of the car. That force is called centrifugal or centripetal force. So it's, it's an acceleration because we're not going in a straight line anymore. We're going in a curved line, even though we're going in constant speed, we're accelerating. What happens is, where our object, let's say it's a car again, here's the center of the car, the center of the radius, and the car's traveling in a circle like this. The car is not speeding up, so its velocity is constant, but it is accelerating in that direction, acceleration towards the center. That is called centripetal acceleration. Centripetal means uh, towards the center. So the acceleration heading always towards that point there. That's causing the car to stop going in a straight line and going us towards a circle. Centripetal acceleration requires the car to have a force on it for that to happen. Let's make it look a bit like a car. There we go. This is traveling, let's say it's traveling towards us and it's going in a circle. The road has to apply a force to the car. The road is a pushing the car inwards. So this is a centripetal force. We could look at it the other way. The car is applying a, a force to the road. So the car is trying to push the road out. So the car is applying a centrifugal force to the road. What about the passengers inside? If you were inside the car, what force would you feel when you're traveling around and going in a circle? You, you notice yourself falling towards the outside of the car. So as you're going around the corner quickly, you'll be pushed towards the outside. So if something's pushing you out, is that centrifugal or centripetal? Centrifugal. Okay, so you are being pushed away from the center. That's a centrifugal force. So because of that, and because it's usually the one you can more easily understand, we more often use the word centrifugal. For example, centrifugal pump, that's the pressure is applied to the fluid because the fluid gets a centrifugal force on it which then pushes, uh, increases the pressure. All right, but just remember that centrifugal and centripetal are just equals and opposites. So if we went back to the, um, a weight on a string, for example, if that was a weight on a string and we're rotating around, we have the string is applying a centripetal force and the weight is applying a centrifugal force and they're equal and opposite. So it's really the same force it's just which body are you looking at? What does the string do to the mass? Centripetal force. What does the mass do to the string? Centrifugal force. 
What about the formulas behind it? Centripetal acceleration equals omega squared r. So it's proportional to the angular velocity squared. If you go, go around the corner at twice the speed, then the acceleration and the forces are four times as high. So it's very sensitive to the speed of the vehicle. That's the acceleration, so from f equals ma. If you know what acceleration is, you only need to multiply by mass and you get this, the force. So centrifugal force is going to be mass times omega squared times r. Centrifugal force is mass, omega squared, so you double the speed, you get double squared, so you get four times the um, centrifugal force times the radius, so the larger the radius, the larger the force at the same angular velocity. Or we can convert that over to linear, and we'll have mv squared over r, if you're using the linear speed, which would be uh, you know, your, your meters per second here. Some applications of um, this other than just weights on a string. I, I've already mentioned a centrifugal pump. As a matter of fact, if you change the speed of a centrifugal pump, you're going to directly uh, change the pressure. <laughs> there we go. In fact, if you double the speed of a centrifugal pump, you'll be aiming towards getting four times the pressure. You won't get exactly four times because there's uh, other things going on, but it, you'll certainly do a lot more than double. So a centrifugal pump is very sensitive to speed. So let's say you had a motor on a pump, and here's your centrifugal fan, say, which is uh, blowing some air, something like this. And there's an intake over here, and then it's getting blown out there. Uh, let's say the motor can only go 14, 14 40 revs per minute because it's a standard motor. If you want to get more pressure, the only thing you can do yeah, is F equals M omega squared R. You can change the uh, speed. That's the first thing if you want to increase the pressure. We're not going to be changing M because that's the density of the air, so you can't do anything. The other thing you could change is the radius. So if you make the radius of the impeller larger, you're going to increase the pressure. But it's only proportional. So if you double the radius, you get twice the pressure. But if you double the speed, you could get, or you're aiming to get, four times the pressure, more, more speed sensitive than it is radius sensitive. So sometimes they size the impeller according to the speed of the motor because you can't change the speed. It's a fixed speed. The other way to change the speed, of course, would be to have a, a V-belt and uh, run this on a pulley. So maybe you have a pulley that speeds it up and then we can switch this over. That's 1440, but this might be doing 3000 RPM. Now, if you're pumping air and you have a limited size for your impeller, you're stuck, you'll have to give, have a high-speed motor. Now, a, a vacuum cleaner, that, like a household vacuum cleaner, they need to get a, a reasonably high pressure for air. The only way they're going to do that is by increasing your res per minute. Otherwise, they need an impeller like a metre diameter. That's not going to happen. So because the impeller is quite small to keep the um, unit convenient, they have to up the speed, which means that they can't use one of these nice, quiet, 1440 or 2800 res per minute motors. They have to use a noisy one, a universal motor, uh, which will do, you know, probably about 5,000, 10,000 RPM. <laughs> That's why you wear face visors. <laughs>